Hello, welcome to this session. This session is about improving your ADF Fusion application's response time by as much as 70%. I'm Frank Howling. I'm an Oracle ADF and Java specialist with Amos in the Netherlands. My focus of the last years has been on performance diagnosis and performance management. I'm the lead architect behind the ADF Performance Monitor, an advanced monitor for measuring, analyzing, improving, and controlling the performance of ADF applications. In this session I will discuss how you can optimize the performance of your ADF application. I will share typical performance problems that are happening very often and how to solve them. How to build an efficient, responsive, scalable ADF application that circumvents frequent bad practices. Quite often in ADF applications, things are happening too soon. This is a category I will discuss. Another category I will discuss is things that are happening too little. Another one is too big. Another category, very important, I will discuss is things that are happening too often. And last but not least, too slowly. This is the agenda for this session. I will quickly jump from one subject to another, so be ready for a lot of information. Let's start with the last category, things that are happening too slowly. Many bottlenecks are simply caused by slow view object queries, PL SQL calls from application modules, or entity object DML operations. Quite often it is hard to track which database executions are slow. Slum, some queries are only slow for certain bind parameter values. And some queries are not slow at all in a development environment, but are slow in a production environment that has much more data. A very quick and simple way to log Execute the database queries is to override the execute query for collection method in the project based view object class. You can use the ADF logger for this. You can print how long it took to execute a query in its usage name. You can also see how often it is executed. This is a very good way, like a stopwatch, to see how long a query took. There are also other ways to detect slow database executions in ADF. Oracle provides the ADF Logger Diagnostic Tool in JDeveloper. And it shows a complete breakdown of an HTTP request where it spent its time. Its time. The disadvantage, however, is that it has too much overhead for use in a test or production environment. Another way to detect slow database executions is to set up a database trace in the database. So you see all the executions from the database perspective. That is also a disadvantage that you don't see it from the perspective of the ADF application. And that is often what you would like to see. Also, a database trace has significant performance overhead. That brings us already to the next category of problems, things that are happening too often. The first problem of the category too often is too many mini queries. This happens often in master detail detail behavior in ADF. For example, we have a page with a tree on it. Each node corresponds to one query. For example, we have a root node here is already one query. Let's say this node has got two children. Another two queries are executed. And if these nodes also have children, four queries are executed. So in total, we have already seven mini queries. And this is not very efficient. Quite often, many mini queries are executed on master detail detail pages. The default implementation of AF3 table and AF3 with associations and few links, unfortunately, queries many mini queries. 
This also happens with custom overrides, for example, few row impulse in getter methods. When in these getter methods, detail few object iterators are executed, many mini queries can be executed. Also, few accessor queries that are used for lookup items in AF table, AF3 table, and AF3 components. Many mini queries then can be executed for the lookup items. Now, what is the solution? The solution of a master detail detail page is to use a single build query that retrieves all the necessary data and replaces all the multiple queries. On the left, we show the old situation where many mini queries are being executed. See how inefficient it is. Now on the right, we query in one single bulk all the necessary data at once. We could use a managed bean uh, to programmatic, programmatically execute the view object from the page definition using an execute with params. And as you can see, this is much more efficient. Another thing that happens far too often in ADF applications is too many database round trips. This happens when the fetch size of a few object is set too low. What is a fetch size exactly? Fetch size is the number of records a few object fetches or retrieves from the database simultaneously. The default fetch size is 1. Let's have a look at an example. We have a uh, few object query few object queries to the database. The database selects six rows. And now with the fetch size of one, let's have a look how the view object retrieves the data. As you can see, it goes one by one by one. This goes, this is pretty inefficient, isn't it? You can set a proper fetch size in your view object editor, the general top at the tuning section. Here you can see the view object fetch mode and fetch size properties. They control how many rows will be returned in each round trip to and from the database. This is very important to set and often overlooked by ADF developers. The rule of thumb is here that you set the fetch size to the number of rows that you use on your screen plus one. You can also set here for form layout when you need one row, you can set the fetch size to at most one row. For create or insert layout, you can set the fetch size to no rows. Let's go back to our example. Suppose we have a page where we can only display six rows. So we put our fetch size on seven the rows we need plus one. We execute the query again. The database selects six rows. And now let's have a look how many database round trips are needed. As you can see, we only need one database round trip. That's pretty efficient. Another item in the too often category is unintentionally left iterators in page definition files. Suppose we have a very smart ADF developer that creates a country table. In the page definition files are the corresponding bindings and iterator. Now later he decides he doesn't need the country's table anymore and he removes the table. But he forgets to remove also the iterator from the page definition. Unfortunately he left the refresh option attribute at if needed. Now, quite often, the query is executed. Another item in the category too often is too many HTTP requests. This is often caused by an inefficient value of the iterator binding range size property. Normally, this the range size corresponds to the fetch size property of your view object. It represents the current set of rows that you display on your page. A rule of thumb is to set the range size to the maximum number of records that you can display in your browser and not more. If you put this too low, 
more HTTP requests can be executed than needed. The most important item in the category too often is too frequent application module pooling, passivation and activation. What is application module pooling exactly? Application module pooling enables multiple users to share several application module instances. So it is a scalability mechanism. It involves saving and retrieving session state data from the database or file. This mechanism is provided to make the application scalable and becomes very important under high load with many concurrent users. The default values, however, can be very, very inefficient and may cause many unneeded passivations and activations. I recommend ADF developers to carefully read the documentation and make themselves familiar and read the ADF Fusion Developers Guide. For 11G Release 2, Chapter 44 is an excellent uh, guide for this. Let's first try to understand what application module pooling passivation is exactly. Suppose we have a pool of five application module instances. We have five users who use these application modules, whose session state is in this application module. Now, suppose a six user comes in. He needs also an application module. What happens now is that one application module is saved to the database. In this, in this example, application module 5 is passivated, saved in the database. And now application module 5 is available for the sixth user. And he will get the application module. This process is called passivation. Let's have a look at what state information is exactly saved during a passivation. All transactional state of an application module is saved. So all new, modified and deleted entity objects. Also all the non-transactional state. So for each active view object, the key of the current row, new rows, view criteria, an executed flag, so whether the view object is executed or not, the range start, the range size, the access mode, so whether the view object is scrollable or uh, range spacing, the fetch mode and, and the fetch size, and if there's any custom data that is also uh, saved. And on the right we see a user uh, session snapshot in XML. Uh, apparently this was for example a page with the departments uh, uh, in it. We see the definition name, the, the usage name, some more information and we see also the key of the current row. Snapshot is saved in the PSTXN table. This table is automatically created when you first run your ADF application. And all rows in this table belong to an, a snapshot of an application module user session. Let's also have a look at understanding application module pooling activation. Suppose again we have a pool we have five application modules and now four application modules are already in use by users. The fifth user is his session state is in the database because he has been inactive for a few minutes. Suppose he has thought he has now clicked again on a link and is sending an HTTP request to the server. And now and he needs an application module. So his session state need, needs to be restored, reloaded into the application module. And this process is called activation. And this may take a few seconds. Let's have a look at the application module pooling parameters. The first one is the init pool size. Suppose we have an application module pool and now we can choose how many application modules we want to create when the pool is started. So this is simply the start value. And I recommend you to put this on a value higher than the default one 
the default value of zero, a high value avoids application module instantiation time when the load increases. So the hit is taken at server start. Then the maximum pool size. The maximum pool size is the maximum number of application module instances that a pool can allocate. You can leave this at its default. Now let's have a look at the referenced pool size parameter. This parameter is often misunderstood. This parameter means the number of application modules in the pool that attempt to preserve session affinity for the next request. So the data in this application module maintain sticky to the user and won't be passivated immediately. It is recommended to increase this value to improve the performance. So bump up this value a bit and this will avoid many expensive passivations and activations. Then the pool polling interval. The pool polling interval is the length of time in milliseconds between pool cleanups. Default, every 10 minutes the application module pool wakes up and removes application modules that are marked for removal. You can leave this value at its default. Then the max available size. The max available size parameter is the number of application module instances that survive a pool cleanup. So when a pool monitor wakes up to do a re resource cleanup, it will try to remove available application modules down to this maximum. So for example, if we have a max available size of seven, it will try to remove all the other ones. A higher value is recommended to make more application modules available this will improve performance. Then the idle instance timeout. The idle instance timeout parameter is the number of milliseconds after which to mark an inactive application module for removal during the next pool cleanup. So an application module will be marked for removal. So the pool monitor wakes up to do a resource cleanup. It will try to remove application modules who are inactive longer than this max inactive age. For example, if an application module is inactive for 11 minutes during a resource cleanup, it will be removed when it's set to its default of 10 minutes. A tip, increase to value to extend the max inactive age and this will make more application modules available and this will improve performance. Finally, the maximum instance time to live parameter. The maximum instance time to live parameter is the number of millis that an application module instance lives in the pool. When the pool monitor wakes up to do a resource cleanup, it will try to remove instances that live longer than this value. A tip is to increase this value or set this value to minus one to make more application modules available. This will improve performance. Let's wrap up the application module pooling parameters. First determine in your application and your situation how many application modules on average a user session uses. This is 1, 2, 5 or 10. This can be different for each ADF application. For example, ADF applications with the UI shell pattern can use for each active step an application module instance and thus need more available application modules. Secondly, calculate how many user sessions you really have during your peak times who are actively clicking around and who are very active. Multiply this number of sessions with short think times by the average needed application modules a user session. Secondly, set the min available size and the init pool size to 80% of the just calculated application modules needed during peak times. This all will result in 
that you avoid application module instantiation time when the load increases. So you take the hit at server startup, which is good. And it also will avoid expensive passivations and activations under normal load. And there are some more application module pooling guidelines. Quite frequently I've been at ADF projects where they had strange behavior in their production environment. It turned out that session state information seemed to disappear. They also had other strange behavior. Often it turned out that they didn't test their application module pooling problems in their development and test environment. You can already test it in your development and test environment. You can do this by disabling application module pooling. So you can go to your application module configuration and uncheck the enable application module pooling. Now, application modules will always be passivated and activated on each request. You can make your application less error prone. There's more important stuff about application module pooling that you should know about. Often this fact is underestimated and can be very dangerous. Do not passivate state of all your transient values at your view object level. This can be very dangerous. If you check including all transient values at your, in your tuning section, all SQL calculated and transient values of all your view row impulse will be passivated and activated when the session state is reloaded. And this may lead to very long running passivations and activations. So for example, if you have hundreds or thousands of rows, all these rows will be uh, passivated and activated. So please do not check this unless you are absolutely sure that you need this. If you are absolutely sure that you need to passivate an attribute, go to the attribute level of your view object. Only if you are really sure, quite often you don't need to passivate it, but you should test it with application module pooling disabled. The last item in the category too often is too many full HTTP requests. Make use of the powerful AX capabilities of ADF. Use partial page request instead of full page request. And this is quite easy. So set where possible on all buttons, links and menu items the attribute partial submit is true. And this applies to all components that start with AF command. Now you can avoid to, that the browser needs to re-execute the JavaScript libraries. It does not need to spend time for cleanup, initialization of the full page. Only a part of the page is refreshed and this is pretty efficient. Okay, let's start with the new category. Things that are happening too big in ADF applications. The first item in the category too big is too much data in ADF BC memory. It can be quite severe if you try to load more database rows and columns than you need, if you overload your ADF application. In the next few slides I'm going to discuss a case with you of the Dutch Ministry of Justice. The performance problems were a huge TVM memory usage very long running garbage collections of over 40 seconds and the root cause of this was that the application data retrieved from the database into memory was not properly limited. Many database rows, sometimes more than 25,000, sometimes even more than 100,000, with too many attributes were loaded into memory. Also to make things worse, their rows and their attributes were retained in the session for an unnecessary period of time. In the next slides I will discuss our findings and solutions. So how come thousands or even hundreds of thousand rows could be loaded into their memory? First, by default, 
view object access mode is scrollable, which is fine. But the problem is when you have a view object that has access to thousands or even hundreds of thousands of rows and you build an AF table on it, when you scroll down an AF table, it will retrieve and load all rows from the database into memory. This will not only take a lot of time, but also waste your memory. They were using a very common pattern in ADF applications, the table form layout pattern. This pattern can be implemented in one page or separate pages. What we see here is one page with on the left a table layout and on the right a form layout. When the user selects a row on the left, automatically on the right the form layout is synchronized because the set current row with key operation is executed. Both layouts share the same view object usage and the same view object definition. So one view object is the base for both layouts. Let's have a look how many rows and how many columns were retrieved from the database. In this case, our form had 44 attributes visible on the page. So we had 44 columns uh, in our view object query. So all these columns were retrieved from the database. Also, we could select thousands or even hundreds of thousands of rows. So for all these thousands of rows, all the attributes were retrieved from the database. Isn't that pretty inefficient? Let's now have a look at how many rows and attributes we really need on our screen. On our screen we only can show a certain amount of database rows to the user, mostly not more than 35. And the form has always got one row where a user can update or create rows. So if we look at how many rows and attributes we need, it, that is only a very small percentage of what we retrieve and fetch from the database. So what is the solution? The solution is to reduce the number of columns retrieved. We can make dedicated field checks for table and form layout. After selecting a row in a table by the user, we can programmatically query the form layout with its ID as bind parameter. Then this view object query will be also very fast. Secondly, we can reduce the number of rows retrieved. We can tune both view objects separately. You can set an appropriate maximum fetch size on the form layout of one and we can use range paging for the table view object. Let's have a look at the view object maximum fetch size. With the maximum fetch size you can limit the impact of non-selective queries that may return thousands or hundreds of thousand rows. You can set these values at the view object editor in the tuning section. And some guidelines are, in general, for table layout, you usually do not need more than 250 rows. For form layout, you always need at most one row. For create or insert layout, you don't need any rows. You can also set this globally for your whole ADF application in metainf adfconfig.xml. The advantages of this, these settings are that you will have a very low memory consumption, which is very good for your ADF application. Also, you will have a very fast execution of your view objects. A very valuable feature in ADF is view object range paging. With range paging, the user can basically say, I would like to see page 9 of the search results. And by the way, I want 10 rows for each page. Then the view object query will automatically retrieve all the rows in range. It will only keep the current range of rows in memory. And this is very good. 
we need to keep the memory consumption as low as possible. You can set the view object range paging in the view object editor at the tuning section. At the bottom you see the access mode which is default scrollable and you can set it to range paging. This is very useful if you need to display more than 500 records in a table. If you need to display thousands of records in the table. In this demo I want to show you the value of view object range paging. But first I will show you a scrollable page. We see a locations table with 47,000 rows. This is of course ridiculous much. I will show you with an access mode scrollable when I scroll down now. All the rows are being retrieved. And let's scroll down to the bottom. Right now all the 47,000 rows are being fetched into memory and wastes the memory. As you can see this also takes time. This takes a lot of time. This is because I also added a club column to the view object. And there it is finally. And now I'm going to show you the difference with view object range paging as access mode. To use range paging I go to the view object that I want to uh, change. I go to the tuning section and at the bottom there is an access mode and here I set range paging. Also I set a good range size and in this case I set it to 50. Let's see the result of changing the access mode of the view object to range paging. Now when I scroll down to the bottom it responds very quickly and only the rows that we see on the screen are being fetched into the memory. When I scroll again you can see how quickly it is. Another thing that is often too big in ADF applications. The scope for managed beans. Recommended is to use as small as possible memory scopes. So for all your scopes use as small as possible. Another thing in the category too big is too much HTML that is sent to the browser. In ADF there are many so-called container components. And the best practice is to make the ID at maximum two characters. So for the page template, region, panel collection, table, tree table, tree and iterator, it is a best practice to make the ID as small as possible. And this is because their child components use their parent container ID in them, as you can see here on the screen. For example, in Firebug you can monitor the HTTP traffic and you can see that the parent ID is used. It makes a big difference in the HTML that is sent to the browser, in the size of the HTML as you can see. You can see that after we made the IDs very small, the child IDs are also smaller. This is good for performance in the browser. Do not put too much logging on. Too much logging has a performance overhead. So the best practice is to switch to severe at the WebLogic Enterprise Manager level. Again a new category. Now the category too soon. What happens too soon in AEF applications? The first item in the category too soon is an AF panel topped component. In this panel topped component, each show detail item has got a region in it. And each region starts a task flow. And what happens? Every task flow is executed when the first top is opened. Of course, this is not what we want. 
Let's have a look at the code. On the left we see the page. So we see the panel topped with the show detail items and the regions in it. And on the right we see the page definition with the task flows and the activation property of the task flows is deferred. So it appears to be quite well. But we still have the problem that each task flow is already executed when the first tab is opened. To prevent this, you can use the property child creation is lazy uncached or child creation is lazy to defer task flow execution of tabs until a tab is opened. This is very powerful. Also for AF pop-ups, there's also a property called child creation is deferred to defer the execution of the pop-up. For task flow in regions, you can use the activation property. You can use activation is conditional and use a con refresh condition on the task flow executable. Another item in the category too soon is application modules and view objects that are instantiated too soon while lazy loading can be used. Lazy loading is a property on the application module. You can set this at the general top at the tuning section and it can defer the runtime instantiation of few objects and nested application modules until the time that they are used. And I can always can recommend to set this to lazy loading. For some components, it is important to consider whether you load them immediately or lazy. Sometimes lazy has got a better user experience when the page is already loaded and the content is loaded later. Especially when the component has got a slow fetch time, when it takes a few seconds, the user can have a better experience. So it is important to consider this. We are already at the last category, things that are happening too little in ADF applications. The first item that happens too little is that there's too little caching of data. You can use a shared application module instance for this. You can use this to group few instances when you want to reuse list of static data across the application. Very important in ADF applications is to set a JVM heap size that is large enough. Quite often I've seen ADF applications with a very small JVM heap size. The best practice is to set the heap size as large as possible within the available physical memory. You can set the XMS and XMX for this. Also quite important is to use a garbage collection strategy that is recommended to maximize throughput and you can use the genpar in JRocket for this. So this is very important uh, in ADF applications. Load tests are extremely useful. With a load test, you can simulate hundreds or thousands of virtual users who invoke your application. In the meantime, you can monitor your backend, your infrastructure, your web logic server, and you can test the scalability and whether you meet your service level agreement or not. This is very important and I can recommend to do many load tests. All load testing tools However, it takes some time to become familiar, so you should start on time with this and not one week before your application goes into production. There are two tools I want to discuss. First, a patch JMeter. It is possible to configure a load test with this, but uh, it is not easy to con configure. You might be able to create a simple load test of a few clicks, but often that's it but it is free. Secondly, 
Oracle has got also a tool, the Oracle Application Testing Suite, OWATS. This is a tool, a promising tool, since 2008 it is from Oracle. Also, with this tool you can create a load test, and it will be easier to configure than JMeter because it has special templates for ADF Fusion applications. The last step of this session is to design your pages smart. Do not display too much data on your page. Keep your page design relatively simple if possible. Do not unnecessarily query data that is not immediately needed. So unopen tree nodes, inactive tabs, invisible pop-ups, unopen drop-down lists. Keep it simple and do not display too much data. My last two slides will summarize the most important performance tips, starting with ADFBC. The most important bottlenecks in ADF applications are still caused by slow few object queries, so be sure to detect and tune them if possible. Set appropriate tuning values on your few object. Implement a table form pattern using two separate few object definitions and usages. Use range paging if you have to display many rows. Use lazy loading on application modules. And size the application module pool. Typically the pool is too small. In the ADF model, set efficient page definition iterator range sizes. In the ADF view layer, use partial submits on all AF command components. Be sure to size your GVM heap size appropriately and choose an effective garbage collection strategy. And last, design your pages smart. Do not retrieve data that is not immediately needed. Thank you for your attention.